Hey everybody, Jim here. Well, it's a new year. Well, not really that new because I've been putting off this video for a while, but still kind of a new year. And I thought I would take this opportunity to give you what, in my opinion, were the top 10 best movies of the long past year, now 2019. 2019 certainly wasn't the best year for movies. It was the year Star Wars ran headfirst into the ground, the year Disney made a shit ton of money farting out a bunch of substandard remakes of much better movies of the past. But despite all that, there were still a few really good movies that came out in that year. And let me tell you about them. Let's start with number 10. Number 10, Ford vs. Ferrari. Ford vs. Ferrari was a fantastic tribute to the American automotive industry, a movie set during the 1960s, and it deals with the grandson of Henry Ford in his rather petty struggle to beat Enzo Ferrari at a race. May not seem like the most compelling of narratives for the average man, but it really does show kind of the competitive nature of the car industry in a really interesting way, and it's a really awesome racing movie. The cinematography showing the car races in this movie is really heart-pounding and exciting. You really get to see just how dangerous this sport is when you're zipping around at well over 150 miles per hour and you're going through really tight turns with other cars and the slightest misstep and you are dead. It is an absolutely heart-pounding and terrifying experience, and it really gives you appreciation for the men willing to do this very dangerous sport. You get excellent performances in this movie by Matt Damon and Christian Bale. Christian Bale's character in this movie was particularly interesting because he seems to be someone like me, someone with high-functioning autism, and thus he's someone who butts heads with the executives at Ford who are more high-polished and by the book and are obsessed with images, whereas he just brazenly says whatever is on his mind. And the way those kind of two personalities kind of intersect with each other is very interesting. But despite his shortcomings in the personal realm, he's clearly the best racer and is still clearly a good father. It, and I really love that dynamic. It, the executives, the Ford executives in this movie were kind of realistically slimy. They weren't like ridiculous over the top caricatures from like a shitty movie like On Deadly Ground or something. But at the same time, they were kind of slimy individuals, which is probably how people like that in that industry really are. They are people, they're not like over the top Captain Planet villains, but they're also people who are a kind of out for their own interests. Realistic. There's like one great scene I really loved in the movie where um, Henry Ford um, the second looks out the window, points to the factory in Dearborn, which I don't live that far away from, by the way, and says about how that factory built all the bombers that uh, helped defeat Hitler during World War II. And that's true, they did. And it really kind of gives you an appreciation for um, everything that goes into that industry, building cars, the racing world. It's just a really awesome flick and a really good character drama, and I definitely highly recommend Ford vs. Ferrari. Number 9, Missing Link. Missing Link, released earlier in 2019, was one of the biggest box office flops in the history of animation. On a budget of $100 million, this movie only managed to gross $26 million worldwide. It's flopping likely means that it probably will be the last movie Leica Entertainment ever makes. Leica Entertainment have made some of the best animated movies of the past decade, and none of them have been big hits at the box office, and only a few of them have made any money at all. And there's been a downward trajectory in the profit margins of Leica's movie, which seems to accumulate in this movie, which was just a massive flop. Yet, it's good enough to be on this list, and it is a really good movie. Like all of Leica animation for movies, it is a stop-motion animated movie, and the stop-motion puppetry is absolutely fantastic. So many animated movies these days are done in the computer that just seems to have become the dominant form that a movie that uses kind of an old handmade method like that is really a breath of fresh air and it's such a shame that this movie didn't do better. It's such a shame that audiences really only seem to watch animated movies if they're made in a computer nowadays, I guess. Well, the plot is a... 
adventurer, voiced by Hugh Jackman, is kind of in search of missing creatures, kind of like cryptozoology stuff, Loch Ness Monster, Bigfoot, what have you. And he goes in search of Bigfoot, and lo and behold, he finds Bigfoot, who can actually talk in this version, and wants to meet the Yetis, who he thinks are other members of his kind on the other side of the world. And they go on a lovely journey together, forming a friendship as they go, and learning some lessons along the way. It's kind of a pretty standard plot, but the voice acting is really good. You got um, Zoe Saldana, um, Zach Galifimekis, as who voices the um, Bigfoot in this movie. And I'm not going to really spoil how it goes when they meet the Yetis, but it's kind of a clever twist. There seem to be a lot of movies made lately about uh, Bigfoot, so quite a few animated movies on the subject. There was that Smallfoot movie, that, that DreamWorks one set in China, also about the Yetis. And now this, kind of odd that all of them got produced in the same period of time, but this is probably the best of them. The jokes are genuinely really funny most of the time. It's a much more light-hearted picture than the last like anime movie, Koba and the Two Strings. And in all honesty, it's definitely not as good, but Koba and the Two Strings was an absolute masterpiece, whereas this one was just good. Enjoyable to watch, funny, entertaining, really well animated, but it's definitely no masterpiece, so it's not like his best, but definitely deserved to do a lot better than it did. There are so many far worse animated movies, like a lot of the shit Illumination Entertainment makes, that seem to make a ton of money. So I'm wondering, why did this movie do so poorly? Why did audiences ignore it? This movie really deserves more attention than it got. If you see it anywhere streaming, just check it out. Or It's totally worth a blind buy if you're into animated movies. I highly recommend Missing Link. It is a charming, funny, and beautiful animated adventure film. Number 8, Avengers Endgame. Unlike Missing Link, this one did not flop at the box office. Quite the contrary, this is now the highest grossing movie ever made, if you don't adjust to inflation. Did it deserve to be? I don't know. Is it on its own really damn good? Yeah. Avengers Endgame is the fourth Avengers movie and kind of the accumulation of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Eleven years of movies kind of all felt like they were building towards this movie. A lot was riding on that, particularly after the massive success of its predecessor, Avengers Infinity War, which ended on a cliffhanger that this movie was meant to resolve. Did it resolve that cliffhanger and give a awesome finish to these characters? Yeah, kind of did. This was a really awesome flick. While I didn't quite enjoy this movie as much as I enjoyed Infinity War, the way Infinity War kind of built itself up and ended on that awesome cliffhanger was kind of a bit stronger, but this one still was really damn awesome. I like that it's a lengthy flick, almost three hours, and the first couple hours weren't really all that action-focused. They were mostly focused on building up the characters, as this is the swan song of a lot of these characters who we've known for almost 10 years now. And that really was the exact right direction to go in. And, of course, it ends with a massive action sequence, which is probably the biggest Marvel's ever done, possibly the biggest ever put on screen in any movie. But you come to expect that from Marvel and Disney's bottomless paycheck. But what really made this movie really satisfying were the character drama that held it all together. Tony Stark's journey from what, the first Iron Man to this one, leading up to his, how sh spoiler alert, his sacrifice at the end, Captain America, spoiler alert, him deciding to stay in the past and live a, his own life. All of these felt like really emotionally satisfying payoffs, as well as the return of everyone who lost or lost in the snap, which we but let's be honest, we all knew was coming. But and they made it work, as everything they did in order to get them back really felt like it meant something. Like it wasn't just ten minutes later they just undo everything. It felt like they really had to strive and achieve something to reverse what had happened. And there had to be sacrifice along the way. And the movie, like its predecessor, also really did a nice job of subverting expectations. 
not just doing things unexpected just for the sake of it, as a lesser filmmaker would, but doing it in a way that really fits this story and really works for these characters in this context. You get a movie that gives you all the big action, computer animated spectacle that audiences come to expect, but it all matters a lot more because we've come to grow and love all these characters. So overall, Avengers Endgame is a really satisfying summer action flick. Number seven, Doctor Sleep. 2019 saw the release of three different horror movies based on Stephen King books. There was a remake of Pet Cemetery, which frankly was an absolute stinker. There is zero reason to watch that movie over the far superior original version of that movie released 30 years earlier. There was the sequel to It, which wasn't a complete stinker, but did also disappoint a little bit compared to its far superior predecessor a couple years earlier. And then we got Doctor Sleep, which was a much more satisfying horror movie. I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage with this one because I have not read the book it was based on. I have read the books for Stephen King's The Shining, and I also am a fan of the Stanley Kubrick movie. Though I am aware that Stephen King didn't like the Stanley Kubrick movie, and having read his book, I do understand why, as it made a lot of deviations from his novel, and thematically it was a very different experience. This one kind of felt like it was balancing themes that were more from King's work while also being a sequel to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining. There are a lot of callbacks to the Kubrick movie while also being an adaptation of Stephen King's books, which, were, again, were very different. And it, it finds a really good balance. From what I hear, Stephen King was much more satisfied with this movie than he was with the original The Shining. And I, I can kind of see why. You go into a lot of the uh, metaphysical horror, kind of cosmic horror that uh, Stephen King is most known for, as well as um, you have various characters with psychic abilities, which also a trope that Stephen King would make use of in a lot of his movies. But what really made this movie work, both its callbacks to the Kubrick movie were generally pretty well done, and, but this story also, which is set many decades later, is disconnected enough that it can work on its own, even if you've never seen uh, Kubrick's The Shining. It really it builds up a really terrifying horror atmosphere, and it's really willing to go to very dark places that even a lot of other horror movies tend to avoid. There's a couple of very shocking moments in it, but you come to expect that when you're dealing with Stephen King. He doesn't spare kids, he doesn't make everything okay in the end. Oftentimes his stories really go to some fucked up places. Uh, Stephen King is a bit of a creepy weirdo. If you've read some of his stuff, they're kind of messed up at times. Really loved this flick. Thought it really kept you on the edge of your seat from beginning to end. I've heard there's a director's cut coming for the Blu-ray version, which some people say is better than the theatrical cut. I really want to see that because I already really like the theatrical cut, and I'm hoping that the director's cut adds even more to it. I know... <laughs> Cooper, I'm sorry, King's books would tend to be very long, so I'm sure there was a lot cut out of this. Definitely recommend Doctor Sleep. Probably the best horror movie of 2019. Number six, Toy Story 4. Did there need to be a Toy Story 4? Absolutely not. Toy Story 3 already wrapped up the series with a very satisfying conclusion. So why the hell do we need a Toy Story 4? The truth is, we didn't really need this movie, but if a Toy Story 4 had to be made, I'm glad this is what we got, because we could have definitely gotten something a lot worse. Toy Story 4 overall was really good. It was an additional ending to the series that it really didn't need, but as a character journey on its own, it's still a very satisfying movie. You kind of pick up pretty shortly, probably less than a year after the events of Toy Story 3, and Woody... It's kind of dealing with a new role in this movie. He's not uh, Bonnie's favorite toy. He's kind of adjusting to that. Yet he's still devoted to her, just as he was to Andy. And you kind of also see that th that he still has some trouble getting over Andy. <laughs> Though at the end of the previous movie, it seemed like he had accepted his new role. 
But you also see lingering thoughts of what he had before being the favorite toy. Which, if you see, like, the relationship between a toy and his kid is similar to, like, a human relationship with a close friend or family member, you kind of see, like, parallels between that. You could see Andy as somebody that you loved and lost in the past, and you pretend like you've moved on from it, but it's... N but you never really fully do. You have some lingering memories of that person, which can still trigger you. You, you can see a theme of trying to get over something you've lost in the past and move on to something different and take your life in a different direction. There's also kind of a message of toys in this not needing to be loved by a kid to be happy. Also, you could also see a parallel there that you don't need to be in a relationship to be happy. That you could be happy being single or happy in a non-traditional relationship. All, all kinds of things. This is kind of Woody's journey. It's almost... It almost does for Woody what Logan did for Wolverine, in, in a way. Obviously, much more appropriate for the younger ones than that one. But there's some parallels to, to that. And he, he, like, meets an old flame from his past and... The animation, of course, light years ahead of the original Toy Story, even pretty significantly improved even over Toy Story 3, which wasn't really that long ago, nine years. You can just see, like, the rain sequence at the beginning, just way more advanced than what was possible when the first few movies came out. It's, it's some really gorgeous stuff. You can always count on Pixar to really push technology forward. But at the same time, unlike something like, say, the Lion King remake, they don't just go for realism at the expense of making characters that are expressive and, and relatable. All the characters still have feeling and emotion in their faces, facial expressions and eyes, which are sadly missing from more realistic animation that goes in Uncanny Valley territory. Toy Story 4 didn't need to exist, but as it is, it's still a really damn good movie on its, on its own. Pixar still seems to have a really bright and positive future. For the last 24 years, they produced some of the best animated features ever made. This is definitely not one of their best movies, but it's still a very solid addition to their lineup. Go see Toy Story 4 if you haven't. Number 5, Alita Battle Angel. Alita Battle Angel is pretty much the movie that fans of action cartoons have waited their entire lives for. If you've ever watched something like certain animes or maybe a Guinea Tartakowski series such as Primal or Star Wars Clone Wars, not the computer animated one like the old hand-drawn micro series, and watch some of these really fluid and over-the-top action sequences, you kind of know what I'm talking about. Those have kind of only existed in um, animated movies before. Alita is the first movie that has really been able to showcase that. Not really live action, because I'm sure most of the sequences in this movie were more computer than live action. But really photorealistically designed. All these really great uh, sequences. And uh, you get a pretty good basic story to boot. It's kind of an underdog protagonist who finds out... In her past, she had a great destiny. She's pulled out of a junkyard, literally, at the beginning of the movie. They find that um, she's a past she can't remember, and she goes on a journey and discovers further piece after piece, and it shows, and eventually she starts kind of a revolution at the end, which gets left for a sequel, which may or may not be made, that she'll lead the underclass of society against kind of an oppressive regime that literally lives above them in this world. Kind of, people will often say that in class struggle that um, the upper class are on top, while in this world it's actually literally the case rather than figuratively. Basically, she has to fight her way through various junkyards and against various bounty hunters and whatnot in this kind of futuristic world. And you get these also RoboCop style um, walking uh, machine tanks. You have 10 seconds to comply. If you can still see this movie in the 3D format, I highly recommend it. This movie makes fantastic use of 3D. And the three-dimensionally choreographed action sequences are just some of the most badass shit that's ever been put on a silver screen. It is an absolutely stunning visual experience. 
And it's awesome that it really feels something what fresh and new. It really doesn't feel like we've ever had a movie quite like this. It, it bears some resemblance to previous movies, like that Scarlett Johansson Ghost in the Shell adaptation from a couple years ago. So, there's some movies that resemble it, but this movie really feels like a very unique combination of a lot of um, previous works. And you get a really cool female heroine, but without it feeling like it's a feminist screed. Honestly, Alita Battle Angel is a movie that action and science fiction fans will absolutely love the hell out of. Go see Alita Battle Angel. Number four, How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World. The How to Train Your Dragon series is, without a doubt, DreamWorks' best franchise of the past decade, and this movie in particular may well be DreamWorks' best animated movie since The Prince of Egypt. It was a really fantastic and often stunning conclusion to the How to Train Your Dragon series. We can see the upgrades in animation in the nine years since the first movie came out, and that really leads to some really superbly done exciting aerial action sequences since, of course, we have a lot of flying characters that really gives this whole franchise a, a lot of ground to create some stunning sequences. But what really makes this movie special is kind of the boy and his dog connection between Hiccup and uh, Toothless. That's kind of been the emotional core of the entire series, and this one really tries to bring you to a really fantastic, bittersweet conclusion. The ending of this movie, uh, I'm not going to completely spoil it, but it reminded me of something like the Fox and the Hounds ending. It just had a really strong heart to it. It felt like a really the perfect ending for this series. And I was really surprised they were willing to give it kind of such a really good definitive conclusion rather than leave it more open in case they want to make future installments later. And I kind of commend that uh, they wanted to make it just a trilogy and move on to other things. While the first movie's message seemed to be to try to look past others' appearances, try to really understand um, other creatures and the world around you, this movie's message seemed to be when it's time to let go when it's time to really let go of something you love. The dragons in this movie and throughout the whole franchise are given very obvious dog-like qualities. They're seen chasing objects, bowing to each other, very, very dog-like traits. I don't think there are any actual dogs in this franchise, so in, in this world, dragons are now the dogs. And, and anyone who's had a connection with a dog, of course, I'm a pet owner myself. You can kind of understand that bond between you and your pet. And uh, this movie kind of building towards the proper conclusion of letting go or doing what's best for them is a really strong uh, message. And it really fit um, with this whole themes this franchise have been building since the beginning. We get um, good performances. They bring back uh, Gerard Butler, despite him being killed off in the previous movie, and some really good... Um, really beautiful flashback sequences. Everything in this movie all works. If I can think of any minor problems, some of the side characters have generally been a bit annoying in the movies, and they're even more annoying in the TV show that's it kind of spun off from it and set between the first and second movie. There's like a five-year time gap between those two movies. Here, there's only about a one-year time gap since the last one. But it never is like to the point where it's like grating or unwatchable. It's just kind of, I wish those characters had been a bit better written. But it doesn't distract from the fact that the main story of this movie is really fantastic. And the main bond between boy and his dragon, man and his dog, is really staggeringly well done. It all leads to a heartfelt and wonderful conclusion. So, in my opinion, How to Train Your Dragon The Hidden World is the best animated movie of the year, and a movie that both kids and adults can enjoy. Number three, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is both a bit of revisionist history, which is a thing Quentin Tarantino has done many times in his career. We, of course, had Django Unchained, which created an entire fictional story 
around the time of antebellum slavery. You had Inglorious Bastards, which created an alternate fictional ending to World War II. And now you have Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which creates a fictional alternate version of the Manson killings that in uh, Tarantino's mind were kind of the turning point separating old Hollywood from the new. He clearly was very nostalgic for filmmaking during that time period. One thing that's always been of note in Quentin Tarantino's movies is he rejects completely modern visual effects and modern filmmaking tropes. Uh, famously, when he made um, The Hateful Eight, he didn't go through a digital intermediate that could do things like give the actors um, cool breath when they uh, shot scenes in the in a really freezing blizzard. He insisted that the sets be made cold enough that you could see their breath for real and all of it be in camera. That's kind of how he is. He likes to do everything old-fashioned, shoots his movies on film, and does not finish them on a 2K DI that kind of limits the resolution of way too many modern movies these days, which makes the movie really beautiful to watch if you got the Ultra HD Blu-ray. And another thing that is very interesting and really cool about Quentin Tarantino's movies is somehow the guy manages to make characters doing rather boring, mundane tasks that just sitting around and having a conversation about random topics. Or in this movie, you'll have Brad Pitt just training his dog in one scene, another scene fixing a satellite, and for some reason it's entertaining to watch. Whereas you would wonder, why am I watching this? This is just everyday stuff, but he really makes these characters so damn cool and, and well realized that it, it's wonderful seeing how he's building them up and to a very brutal and visceral conclusion. That's kind of another trope of Quentin Tarantino's movies, is most of the movie will just be characters talking to each other, and then there'll be a couple scenes with some really shocking violence, and if you're looking for that in this movie, you get it here. You get two uh, different characters. You get Leonardo DiCaprio's character, who plays a movie star, who... On the outside, seems to be a kind of guy that everyone wants to be. He's a famous actor, he's got all these movie gigs and what have you, but you go into and develop him, and you see that he's deep down a very insecure man. Whereas his stunt double, Cliff, played by Brad Pitt, even though he's in a much lower position, lower cast, he's portrayed much more as the man that every guy wants to be. He's um, handsome, he's a really good fighter, he's always in emotional control of himself, and he can fix everything, he can train his dog to do all kinds of cool stuff, and the dog is practically the hero of this movie. There's uh, this pit bull in the movie and who's used to uh, awesome degree. Let's just say the, the pit bull does what he was bred to do. And it's nice that uh, he used a real dog. Too many movies nowadays are computer animating animals whenever you need an animal in this movie. Like, there's this upcoming trailer for this Call of the Wild movie with uh, Harrison Ford working with a dog that's obviously computer generated. And I'm like, use a real dog. They're not hard to train. Come on. Nope. And that whereas in this movie, you get a real dog. And it's used very well at the end of the movie. With Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you get both a great character study, you get kind of a interesting and rather twisted alternate version of history, kind of a revenge fantasy, if you're familiar with how things went down in the Manson shootings. Probably researching how the Manson shootings went down and really being aware of everything that happened will kind of make the themes of his ending make a lot more sense. I imagine if you watch this movie without having a clue how that happened. It might be a little confusing what Tarantino was trying to say. If, if you can handle um, some of the more extreme elements in this movie, you'll have a great time with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's definitely one of the best movies of 2019 and proof that Quentin Tarantino still got it in him. Number two, Joker. Joker was a movie that really took the world by storm just a few months ago. It's the first R-rated movie that ever grossed over a billion dollars. And given that this movie was made for only $55 million, it was the most profitable movie of 2019. Even though it didn't make as much money as, say, Avengers Endgame, when you consider the massively higher budget of Avengers Endgame, Joker actually was a more profitable movie. 
what made this movie such a massive hit? Mostly it was the predictable backlash against it because it tried to have sympathy with the mental issues of a lonely male, a group of people that the mainstream pe press and the left have in recent years taken to constantly vilifying in order to show how compassionate they are. Yeah. And it's worth examining, I might make a whole video just on that subject, why this movie really was hated by a segment of the elite, and why I really think that makes this movie one that the general audience should enjoy even more. It's basically the story of a mentally ill man who's kind of broken down at the beginning and slowly over time. He is mistreated by society until he eventually grows into a nihilistic uh, killer. This movie is a tragedy because you can kind of see all the various things that happen in this guy's life that led him down the dark path that he eventually becomes. You kind of see he didn't really have to become the monster he becomes at the end of this movie. This was the, an indictment on the way society treats outcasts and the mentally ill. If any criticism could be made of this movie, it's that although it's a great movie about mental health and a great character study of this, this man, and this mentally ill individual eventually becomes the Joker. The Joker in this movie really isn't the comic book villain, the Joker. He, do he doesn't fall into um, some acid that bleaches his skin. He doesn't lead any criminal enterprises. And you never get the feeling that this guy could be some kind of criminal mastermind who could terrorize Gotham for years or fight Batman. Batman, of course, isn't in this movie, and you have a feeling if Batman were to show up, the movie would be over in five minutes, because this version of the Joker is not the criminal mastermind who could outthink Batman. Maybe it's not a very good Joker movie, but as a movie on its own, ignoring the comics and just judging it as a study on mental illness and society's treatment of underclass, it is a really damn good movie. Joaquin's Phoenix performance is one he absolutely deserves the Oscar for. He absolutely nails it. You both are creeped out by him and you pity him at the same time. He's a character who, of course, is insane and becomes more insane as the movie goes along. A character who has visions, fantasizing that he's having sex with somebody who he's not character who's driven to some horrific acts of violence at the end, but he's also someone who's incredibly pitiable because he's also a character with a very dark past, the character who had horrible things done to him, he's a character who everyone around him treats with absolute contempt because they see that he's kind of has issues, that he's a mentally ill man. And it all leads to a really dark and gripping conclusion, which also nicely is one that can be interpreted in many different ways. You see that Arthur Fleck's narration of what happened, and we see the entire movie from his perspective, he's in almost every scene, He's not always a very reliable narrator. He sees things that aren't there. So you're left wondering at the end how much of this was real and how much was a creation of this man's disturbed mind. And it's something that can be debated. It's something that could be discussed. And that's the mark of a really good, thoughtful piece of cinema. Joker may not be a good superhero, super, sorry, super villain origin story, but as a movie itself about mental illness and society's treatment of it, it's an absolutely phenomenally brilliant film. And it's one that absolutely deserves Oscars. Go see Joker, if you think you can handle it. Don't show the kids this one, but if you can handle a pretty dark and disturbing flick, Joker is for you. And my number one best movie of 2019, 1917. Now, I didn't think it would be possible for any movie to beat Joker after I saw it, but one movie at the very end of the year did. 1917 is not only the best movie of 2019, this is easily one of the best war movies I have ever seen, period. One of the best movies, period, I have ever seen. It is an absolutely stunning masterpiece that I think will be watched by people a hundred years from now. Directed by Sam Mendes, who's most famous for works like Road to Partition and Skyfall, which are also really damn good movies. Sam Mendes is an incredibly talented director. 1917 is basically set in the trenches of World War I, and it concerns two British soldiers 
who are given a mission to deliver a message to a colonel in order to call off an attack that they know will lead to a slaughter. And they go through a journey across no man's land in order to deliver this message. This is a personal journey for one of these young men because his brother is one of them that's headed to the slaughter if he doesn't deliver the message in time. That alone is a very compelling start for a story and a really good basis for watching these uh, two characters go on this journey. If I could think of one thing, it's this movie kind of deserved a better title than just 1917. It it just giving given the title of the year it's set in was kind of lame. It should have been like called No Man's Land or something a little bit more grim and powerful because it is a really grim and powerful story. And the thing that really makes this movie unique, something that, to my knowledge, has never really been done in an entire movie, is the entire movie is a single continuous shot. Just following these characters as they go through this often horrific and gorgeous journey through No Man's Land. And I don't know if you remember the 2006 movie Children of Men. While that movie was thematically a little bit of a whacked out film, it had one really great sequence where there's like a 15 minute shot where they lead this baby out of this war zone and you see all these various things happening around them and the whole shot is incredibly stunning and it ends with this scene where everyone, both sides, lower their weapons and let them with the baby pass. Just one of my favorite scenes in any movie. And, and 1917 is basically an entire movie like that. You see these uh, two men go into like uh, various trenches. All you see trip lines, um, enemy attacks, uh, planes through the air. Really, this movie gives you the feeling of being a soldier in a major war more than any other movie I've ever seen. The way it just follows them through their journey, and the way everything is shot from their perspective. Like you don't doesn't like when you see planes in the sky, it doesn't cut to the planes, or you get views that these two guys couldn't possibly see. No, everything's from their perspective. So you're seeing the war as these two men see the war. So you really get a feeling of being there. A feeling that I don't think any other war movie has replicated as well as this movie. And, and there's a really fantastic sense of suspense. You don't know if there's an enemy soldier who's going to shoot them around the corner. And you're quickly led pretty early on that anyone can die. It's quite likely that these men, maybe one of them or both of them, won't make it to the end of this movie. It's not just that nameless people in the background die. No, uh, characters who are even well-developed, they can die too. It's the, I saw this in Dolby Cinema. Normally, I don't really see that as worth the extra expense, but I knew this one was going to be a special one. And it was one of the best experiences I've had watching a movie in a really long time. All the way up to the very end, it is absolutely heart-pounding. Just trying to get that message, trying to survive, trying to save your fellow men in such a brutal situation, surviving against all odds. 1917 is an absolutely stunning look at, at World War I or any war, really. It's just a, an experience more than any other movie. 1917 is a masterpiece, and if you haven't seen it, you owe it to yourself to watch it. And those are my top 10 favorite movies of 2019. In 2020, we have a new Chris Nolan movie about time travel. That looks awesome. We got uh, the remake of Dune, which is by far my most anticipated movie of this year. And we got I don't know, Godzilla vs. Kong and two Pixar movies. So, who knows? Maybe uh, this year we'll top 2019. Everyone, I hope you all have a fantastic year. Have a great day. Bye.